So first of all, I want to thank you all for being here and spending your morning with us. I hope that breakfast didn't disappoint you. I mean, the, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, the guys are really good, so they woke up really early today, and that tells us about their attitude. So um, I want to start with a personal story. I actually uh, shared this story only once, uh, but I decided that it would be a good analogy for what I'm about to talk about. It was um, uh, actually more than 30 years ago. It was the late 80s. I was serving in the Soviet Union Army. Back then it was still the Soviet Union. I was in an um, artillery division, and I was at the command. I was the sergeant for the artillery unit. Um, and, and we had some uh, shooting practice. Just for you to imagine what's a shooting practice, peaceful day, everything is like you know, peaceful time, but still this is a huge artillery weapon. I mean, it's a huge one, and it got the missile of a 100 pound weight that is shooting like 10 miles ahead, and you never see where it hits because there's an observ observatory point, and they correct the shooting from there, so we only shoot. So um, we had two cannons at that time, and the cannons were pretty old. They came from the World War II, but they were still good for practice. So, you know, the end of Soviet Union, so, you know, and for 19 years old, for me at that time, guy, I was a young sergeant, it was a huge experience. So I have to tell you that we had two commanders. One of them was a complete nightmare. I mean, really a nightmare. He was the guy who was always righteous, he was making us wrong. He was making us miserable. He was always screaming. He was, you know, the kind of major, the kind of commander you don't want to have. He was always speaking up uh, on us. He was trying to make us feel killed and all that. Uh, and the second one was the complete opposite of the first one. He was polite. He was intelligent. He never raised his voice. He was really a great guy, a great partner. He respected us, the soldiers and the sergeants. So a great guy to be around. But the bad news was that and the command was the first one at that day. He was commanding the, the shootings. So we couldn't hit the target. We just we were shooting and shooting, and we were doing parallel shooting. So two cannons were shooting at the same time. And at some point, I realized what was going on. But the worse it got, you know, the, the louder the guy was on the radio who was screaming at us and pushing and pressing and resisting and all that. So at some point I did realize that you know the missiles that were flying, and you can actually see them, they're like two black spots that are flying away from you. So the trajectory of one of them crossed the trajectory of another, so they were shooting like that. Instead of shooting like this, like you know, parallel, they were shooting one, the right one was hitting left, and the left one was hitting right. And there in 10 miles, nobody realized that it was the other way around. So if you can you know, only imagine how terrible it should be when you realize something like that, and you can't tell about that. You, know, you just can't say honestly that this is what's going on. Um, I think this is a very good analogy of uh, often things that are going on in our organization. In our organizations, you know, sometimes things don't fly in the right trajectory or they don't, sometimes they even fly in a different trajectory or even, even a different direction. But you don't know about that. Why? Because people are scared and it's not safe for them to tell what's really going on. So I looked at the fellow commander sergeant who was next to me and I realized that there's a back officer there, lower rank than that one, but he was still there checking on us. And I realized that they too know what's going on, but they were silent. They probably knew what was going on even earlier than I did. So we decided, three of us, not me personally, but three of us decided to keep silent. And it was continuing for two more, I guess, hours. Can you imagine the nightmare? Then finally we, we went back to the camp. I talked to the second commander. I came to him. It was really a scary thing to do also, you know, to take the responsibility and say about what's going on. And uh, what he told me was really surprising and shocking for me. He said, Vladimir, thank you very much for being honest. And thank you for telling this. He wasn't, he was really calm. He said, this is our responsibility. So don't worry about that. That was, by the way, a huge example of responsibility because he said, I will take care of that. And he did. 
So the next time we met, we went to the film and we continued shooting, everything was fixed, and we never got back to this uh, situation. So um, I'm doing what I'm doing for more than uh, 20 years, and I do understand that there are three things that should be all together for you to be successful in any area of your life, whatever you work. And those three things are, the first one is knowledge. You gotta know knowledge in the area that you are a professional in. That's why we go to the universities, that's why we take MBA courses. Uh, if you are in sales, you gotta be a professional in sales and you gotta get the knowledge. If you are in finance, you gotta know finance. If you are in marketing, for example, you gotta be good there. So knowledge is the first thing that should be at place. Um, I have this example of uh, driving a car. Uh, everybody who remembers how he learned how to drive a car does remember that you first got some kind of knowledge, right? Whether it's a stick transmission or an automatic transmission, whether you have two pedals or three pedals, how you know the, the traffic rules and all that, they're different in different countries. But you, you gotta know that. Otherwise, you won't even step close to the car. I hope you won't step close to the car if you don't get the knowledge. Okay, uh, then you get the knowledge, but you have to get the practice. So the second thing that should be in place is your skills. What are skills is something that you do automatically without even thinking about that, okay? So thing number two is skills. And uh, if you will remember how you tried to drive your car in the beginning, it was terrible because you knew all the right things, but you couldn't put them in place together like pressing one pedal, taking the other with your left foot, and looking into the rear mirror and thinking this is the right moment to start, remember? And then you started, and then you get all those, especially if you begin to drive here in New York City, it's a nightmare because everybody hates you when you do that. So uh, knowledge and skills are two things that are very necessary for you to be successful. But it's not enough, because the bottom line, the thing that really makes you successful is your attitude, okay? And attitude is something that is uh, the area that I've been, you know, working in for many, many years. The attitude goes back to the story I told you in the beginning. We were good professionals, we know how to do things, we knew that something is wrong and how to fix it, but we didn't do it because of the attitude. And the attitude is the bottom line or the foundation of whatever is going on. So I, I, I had a, a new example right now, like an hour ago or a bit more than that, I took a drive here, I took a taxi, and the driver was sitting there, and you know, sometimes you've got one of those drivers who talk a lot, so he was like talking a lot about everything is bad, the city is not like it was, it's not how it used to be, nobody get good food, everybody's driving like crazy and all that stuff. And he's actually, at the moment, is the one who's driving like crazy. And he's the one at the moment who's like, you know, going fast, breaks, then he goes right, then he goes left. And then he said how bad those guys are that, you know, are not allowing him to stand in this line. So actually, what I should have to tell him is, buddy, listen, you're the one with the bad attitude right now, okay? You're the one who's not responsible, or you are responsible for what's going on on the road. So attitude is the main point and the foundation of all the results that you have. And I'll tell you a little bit about the mission of the company that I uh, work for. Um, it's creating results through organizational and employee transformation. That's what Ivan just said. It's not actually the business, business training about the uh, skills and knowledge and how for you to do your business. Um, and it's also not a training about you know, how you should do something. It's about how things are but um, in a personal uh, level. I mean, not the personal, like you as a person, but you as a human be being, you as an individual. And when you transform something in your head, in your perception of what's going on, when this kind of transformation happens, then it influences the, you know, the business. So this is, I think, the only way to do that. And there are two, actually, ways to do trainings and to do stuff and I think that the, the way that we chosen is a little bit different from most of the uh, American types. Usually it's, you know, more entertaining, more lectural thing, more, you know, to empower you, to give you good energy, to give you a give you good impression when you walk out of the training room and then you say, yeah, I like it, it's good. 
but then it's still like more of the theories, like you know, concepts that you have. Uh, and only when the transformation really takes place, when something is shifted inside, when you've got the shift in your thinking and your perception, then something actually is going on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Well, yeah, that's about me. Probably the, the only thing you, uh, that uh, I was the winner of the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year 2015 in category B2B. That is exactly what I'm talking about. Let's do the next one. So this is the unique methodology, and these are the, the benefits. By the way, I'm, we're going to give you this thing at the end of this presentation, so you're going to keep all those uh, slides and information there, and we can send it to you if you want it digital uh, later. So it's actually uh, about creating and support the cultural shift that will take place in the organization, and that is uh, the most important part. Okay, the next one. So how do we do it? Uh, we call it the context, or we call it the environment. I like the word context a lot. So what is context? There are several definitions of the word uh, context. One of the definitions is that context is a filter through which you look at things in your life. Um, and you know, if you're looking at some uh, context, uh, things look a certain way. If you're looking from a different context, they look differently. Like the guy who I was taking a ride with today in the morning, he was in a kind of negative context, uh, victimized context. Um, you know, everybody are jerks context, and I'm like the good guy here context, and I'm separated from all of them context, and I have nothing to do with it. And um, when you're looking in certain things in a certain context, it makes a huge difference. The other definition of the context is the culture in which people actually work. And uh, if you shift your context, you shift actually everything that's going on in your organization. If you take a person from a good context or a good environment, and you put him in a bad environment, he begins to work like in a bad environment people are working. And backwards, if you take the, somebody from the bad environment and put him in a good environment, he has a shift in his thinking and in, in his attitude. So well, we always live in the present. And why we live in the present as individuals or as organizations, we ba base what we do on the past, okay? Why is that? Because this is how our mind is wired. It's wired to make the decisions based, based on the, you know, what you already know. And on one hand, this is good because it protects us from doing something bad and terrible. And so that's good. But on the other hand, making decisions based on the past or based on the culture that you're in right now, it's bad because it limits you. And when you go to the future, and the future will happen anyway, the future will mostly like, like, look like the past. Okay? So if you really want to have something happens, uh, to happen in your organization, which is extraordinary, extraordinary future, then you gotta make a shift in the context. You gotta create a different context in which you live. So this is what we're doing. We're not talking about what kind of context you should have and be responsible and all that stuff, but we actually make this shift. So how do we do this shift in context? Once again, not by telling you how it should be, but by acknowledging what is right now by acknowledging what kind of attitude, what kind of habits, mental habits, and like action habits do you have in your organization. And this is something what most of the trainer or some of the trainer are skipping. They're not looking up at what's going on in the organization, like the guy that I told you today about, or the thing that I told you in my first story. You know, in order to change this, you have to admit it. And you also got to know that there are always two kind of cultures in any organization, always. At the same time, two cultures. One culture is the culture which I would call formal culture that they write about in the booklets. When you come to organization, they tell you this is the kind of culture we have or we might have or we want to have. And then you go in and in a couple of days, maximum a week or two, you realize what is the real culture, what is the real context in the organization. And usually, they are very distinct. They are very different, those two cultures. So um, most of the programs are focused on what the culture should be, what is the right way to create the culture. 
you know, good examples of big company, Apple, most of the time and all that. And people are sitting and saying, okay, this is cool, I want it to be like Apple or Google or whatever. But then they come back to their own organization and they face what's really is going on there. But like I didn't admit it in my 19-year-old surgeon time, some people are not admitting what's going on there in the organization right now because most of the people have to protect themselves like I did like 30 years ago from their organizations. Now uh, listen, protect themselves from their organization because it's not safe. So if we create the environment of trust, and what is trust? Trust is when you can feel yourself safe in the organization. You know that uh, human beings are social animals. Everybody knows that. We used to live in groups. The only reason for that was to feel safe, to be protected. Now, oftentimes, you know, when you become the boss, you become offensive, you become, you know, dominating, and you, 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 you create the atmosphere of fear and pressure and resistance. And oftentimes, this is what actually takes place in the organization, and people are not open enough and free enough to be themselves to you know, work fully and to participate and make all the effort they should make for the organization to be a truly extraordinary. So uh, can we just get back for one reason? The experience, uh, uh, the, the expertise is, is uh, making individuals aware, that's what I said, of the context they operate within right now. And context is everywhere. You actually, you know, you, it is something that you can't feel. I mean, you can touch, but you can definitely feel it. And uh, context is everywhere. When you when you go to uh, business negotiation, you know, in, in a couple of minutes, you know what is the context of the person you're talking to. You can feel it in between the lines. It is something that you can definitely feel. So even though that you can't touch the context, it's still something that influences everything a lot. And there's another expression that is really strong. The context defines the content. Whatever the content is in your organization, whatever you do, if, if you if you don't set the right context, then you won't you won't you won't have the right results. For example, if it's a hot context, it's in the environment of the desert or in North Pole, two different contexts. There is different content in which and another. Okay, if you take the polar bear and put it in the context of the desert, he won't survive there. So technology is good, ideas are good, money is good, everything is good, but it's all content. But if you don't have the right context, it, it will uh, vanish once again. So personal responsibility, that's a huge part of the, uh, the context. And choosing to change the context. That's, this is, by the way, probably the number one thing. If you, you, know, if you will leave this place and you will make some decisions or you will, make some, you will act on something that you wouldn't be taking action if you wouldn't be here, that would be a great thing to do. If you will just choose to, to do something. If you're not the big CEO or you're not responsible for the company, the whole company, you can be always responsible for the context and for the relationship with the person near you. You can always create a small context around you and that would influence you know, people around you. So changing or choosing to change the context. Okay, let's go further. So uh, how does context change everything from dysfunctional teams, conflict, lack of focus, pure, poor communication, low performance and growth, toxic attitudes and low moral and engagement to clear and effective working context, strong relationships, shared vision. This is important too. Now I work in an organization for many, many years and I know that it's rarely that you can meet someone in the organization who truly believes and shares the goals and the visions. If you want to be really honest, they're always the owners or sometimes the CEO or sometimes the managers which tell you it wouldn't be bad if we'll have this and this or such and such results. But then you go down and people are playing their own games, people are doing their own things without even sharing or sometimes even knowing the goals of the organization. Or if they do know it, they, they share it formally, not really. So to be engaged uh, and share vision and mission and purpose, that, that is a very huge thing. Open communication, that what didn't take place in my first example, I couldn't make an open communication with my first commander, and then it happened with the second one. High engagement, personal responsibility, positive environment, uh, peak performance, and extraordinary 
results. Okay, we go uh, further. Uh, the technology of achieving extraordinary results, I have not too much time left. Uh, we do it usually in three uh, steps. Uh, we have three courses, and every course takes two days. And uh, so there's course one, course two, and course three. One of them is uh, about personal effectiveness. Okay, you can see it here. And um, you know, we um, actually talk about the context that is at place. We talk about your beliefs, your ideas, your attitude, and how you personally influence the organization. The second course, it's about building relationship, is where we find out what actual games we play, how I affect the, uh, the group, and then we move to the team. And um, there is a definition of a team, which is unique and almost the same all over the world. I have trainings in many, many countries, in many, many places, and there is always one definition of a team. Um, that a team is a group of people with shared goals and shared vision. On one hand, it's so, but if you will look from the team from the outside, that is a group of people. But if you look at the team from inside, it's only one individual with a certain attitude towards the rest of the guys, toward the team. And if you are missing this one person, then there is no team on both sides. If you, know, if you have 11 players in a soccer team, and, and one of them is not giving the all effort, then there is not a team. And when there's one guy or one person who takes the lead and takes responsibility, he can create the team by example. So I say that the team is not a group of people, but an individual effort, an individual attitude, and that's their responsibility. And that's a different perspective from what a team uh, might look like. Okay, so uh, we go next. I also, I already said that the first course is about personal effectiveness, self assessing professional capabilities and increasing levels of productivity. And th there is, of course, the introduction to the, the methodology because it's kind of different from what people usually, um, again, you know, w when you walk into the training room, uh, people come there with their habits. As I said, mental habits and, you know, uh, habits of acting a certain way. Um, and the way they react to the trainer and a uh, trainer is an irrigation or his an, a stimulus that provokes some kind of reaction. So the, the reaction that he provokes is actually the reaction that the people always are showing in their work. So we got to know those reactions. We got to know how people connect to each other, how they respond to each other. And that's an interesting th thing to reveal. Of course, they know that already because they're working in the organization for many years. But they're not talking about that usually. They're hiding. So we pretend that we're not pretending while we are pretending, you know, this kind of stuff in the organization. So you reveal all this uh, pretending stuff. Um, uh, the, the second course uh, is um, about building relationship together in a group. And there is a very serious, huge process that reveals actually all the relationships there. And the trainer really explains uh, new interpretations. By the way, it's, uh, all, all we do is we talk about different interpretations. Any event that is taking place doesn't have a meaning inside unless you put on the meaning there. So you put on the meaning based on the context and based on the interpretations that you're in, and your interpretation divide your attitude and your reaction or proaction to what's going on. So it's the interpretation that makes a difference, and the interpretation arrives or comes with the context. Okay, and the third course is about creating a team, learning how to create a team. It's actually not about talking how to create a team, but experiencing other people as teams. So we work in some organizations that are together for 10 or 20 years, and they never experience themselves as a strong team. Uh, before as they do after the third course. And that's, that's really an unbelievable thing to see. You know, when people are working in huge companies, we recently did a uh, training uh, for a big company which is called uh, Jet Smarter. You probably heard about the company. They're doing the app. It's similar to the Uber, but they're doing for the aviation flights. You can book a ticket for a jet for the price of the uh, business uh, class ticket. 
Um, and and, and the, the guy who created the company, actually, he's a genius. He has uh, excellent ideas. The, train, the, the company is working for five years. Um, but, you know, it's the, the model, uh, and that's like not the secret information you can tell. It, uh, it, it's an open information on the internet. Um, the model was, wasn't really working well, so they had to make a decision to make a shift. And they had, had all those you know, good, smart people who came from Uber, from different companies, who were in charge of you know, huge responsibilities. But they couldn't make the model as a trainer. And you know, that, that when I do things like that, I have to be more like in a lecture style. This is not the, the kind of thing that I really uh, uh, you know, am a professional in. It's like a, a football coach would really lecture about something or actually coach a team. It's different uh, things. So I, I, I'm, I'm basically, what I'm doing all the day, every day, almost every day, is coaching people, not reading the lectures. So um, in today's uh, world, uh, companies have the access to the same resources, okay? Money, people, technology. But uh, what could really be a competitive advantage for the company is the context or the environment that you work and for order to make this shift, you gotta make a decision to make the shift, you gotta be honest about the culture, about the context that is actually here, about the real environment in your company, you gotta talk about that, you gotta create an open atmosphere and you gotta make this choice not only for yourself but for your people and then taking responsibility and creating the right environment will make a huge a shift. So of course you can use the tool of business relations or you can do it yourself. And as I said, you can do it not only with the organization itself, the big organization, but you can do it in small steps in the area where you can actually influence, even if it's only another person in your relationship, that's still a big shift for me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and if you have any uh, questions for me, I will definitely be glad to answer those uh, questions. Thank you very much.